Welcome everyone to today's webinar. I'm Anuja Vertia with Beckles Hospital Review. We will begin today's webinar with a presentation and we'll have time at the end of the hour for a question and answer session. You can submit any questions you have throughout the webinar by typing them into your control panel in the space labeled enter a question for staff and clicking send. We're looking forward to hearing your questions. Additionally, in about a week following the webinar, we will be sending you a copy of the presentation to the email you used to register. At this time, it is now my pleasure to start today's webinar by introducing our presenter. Dr. Wayne Farley is the Chief Medical Officer, Women and Children's Services for QuestCare, a subsidiary of Envision Healthcare. In this role, Dr. Farley facilitates engagement between QuestCare's senior executive team and client hospital leadership. He provides medical oversight, expertise, and leadership to ensure the delivery of affordable, quality healthcare services. Additional responsibilities include the strategy, development, and implementation of innovative clinical programs that include collaboration with client facility leadership. Following the completion of his residency at Texas Tech University Health Sciences Center, Dr. Farley practiced ob obstetrics and gynecology in Texas for 18 years. In 2008, he left private practice to develop QuestCare ob Obstetrics. Since then, eight OBGYN hospitalist programs have been established in Texas and Colorado. Dr. Fali, I'll now turn the floor over to you. Thank you, Anusha. Um, welcome, everybody. Good morning or good afternoon, wherever you are. Uh, I, I want to extend my thanks to uh, Becker for the opportunity to present today. And we're going to get started. I want to be respectful of everybody's time and try to finish uh, promptly. Um, the uh, presentation overview that you see before you uh, we will will be one of the few slides that I'll will read bullet point for bullet point uh, because it is what we want to discuss today and kind of what the objective of the uh, of the talk is. Uh, we want to talk about what the specialty OB hospitals medicine has achieved and why it's growing so much. Uh, we want to talk about the unexpected benefits and the beneficiaries of that. Uh, we want to discuss why a safety-focused hospital shouldn't be without an OB hospitals program and statistics that every hospital leader uh, needs to know. Uh, we want to discuss how OB hospitals programs are evolving uh, and predictions for the future. Uh, I will say when we started back in late 2007, 2008, uh, we knew that 10 years uh, from then that the programs will look completely different, and in fact they do. It is a quickly evolving uh, subspecialty, if you will, even though it's not recognized officially as a subspecialty of obstetrics, but it is uh, quickly growing and expanding, and, and the face of the programs are changing almost daily, and we'll touch on that as well. We're also going to discuss some of the obstacles to implementing an OB hospitalist program and key considerations for outsourcing the program. Um, so it's a good thing to get to know the audience uh, and who we're talking to today. So we want to start with a poll question, and uh, that is uh, question number one that you see before you is how does your organization currently provide OB coverage? Choice A is a physician call schedule, choice B is an in-house OB hospitalist program, and C is an outsourced OB hospitalist program and D is either uh, another type of coverage or you're just not familiar with how that's handled. So if you would, go ahead and, um, and answer that for us and then we'll kind of know what, what audience we're, just, we're talking to today. Dr. Farley, the results are live for you now. Okay, so that's interesting. 67% uh, use a physician call schedule, still 21% uh, an in-house OB hospitals program, 9% is an outsourced OB hospitals program, and 15% are unfamiliar. So that, that gives us a lot of information on who we're talking to today, and, and, and it's interesting. Uh, I guess I'm a little bit surprised about the, the number of uh, people that are still using call coverage. Okay, my slide is stuck. 
Sorry about that. Okay, we're back on track, I believe. So we consider OB hospital programs to still be in the infancy period. Uh, if you if you look back, um, uh, I use the term 10 to 13 years ago a lot. I use the, that because 10 years ago was when we kind of started uh, the OB hospitals business, and and uh, 13 years ago is when the first article um, uh, was published. And uh, that was published by uh, Dr. Weinstein with regards to um, to the laborist programs. And I apologize, I'm not I'm not getting my slides to move for some reason. Uh, yep. it, with regards to hospitalists in general, Dr. Wachter uh, published a uh, article in 1996 regarding uh, hospitalist medicine. Uh, that was back during the time uh, among the environment of managed care and DRGs for any of you that are old enough to remember that. And uh, that was a, an article that addressed internal medicine hospitalist programs. And, um, and then in uh, 2016, just last month, he actually published a follow-up article to that. I would encourage you to look at it. It's very interesting. It's called Zero to 50,000, which is the 20th anniversary of that article. And then Dr. Weinstein is credited for the first article in 2003. Uh, with regards to uh, laborist, and uh, that's an interesting article to read. And that article was actually uh, published and, and addressed the evolution of laborists due to three primary factors, and that was quality of life, burnout, and uh, the professional liability insurance crisis that we were kind of experienced back in those days. The um, so how have we grown over the years? And uh, even though it's young and still in the infancy stages, as I mentioned before, um, the um, the growth has been quite incredible, and we expect it to continue along that uh, route as we uh, as as the programs mature. So, what are the nuances of this specialty? Uh, the the terminology is as as has gotten quite confusing as. The laborist was the initial term, but now there's OB hospitalist, there's OBGYN hospitalist, um, and, and depending on what the services are provided, kind of depends on what the program is referred to. Um, a laborist program, uh, primary labors patients, and that's all they do. An OB hospitalist program labors the patients and also can provide services to the private physicians in the hospital. And then the OBGYN hospitalist provides obstetrical and gynecological services, laboring services, and usually services to the physicians on the medical staff. Those services can be in-house or outsourced. Um, and also programs that identify themselves as one of the above uh, three are oftentimes really just call coverage or doc deck coverage, whatever the terminology your hospital may use. And it should be clear by the end of the presentation of, of, uh, of why that's not really considered to be an OB hospitals program, a laborers program, or an OBGYN hospitals program. So the the impact of the hospitals programs is is, is it, it, it penetrates many different areas of the hospital. These are just some of them. It affects certified nurse midwives, uh, perinatologists, residents, the antepartum and postpartum units, and of course labor and delivery and the emergency department and the OBED if one exists in that particular labor and delivery, and of course the inpatient units as well. So the top ten. Uh, OB hospital services, um, not in any particular order because um, the um, every program is different. Every OB, OB hospital, every laborers program is different. But these are the top ten services that the program uh, most programs provide. I won't read every one of them to you, but the top one is uh, immediate availability of emergency deliveries and C-sections or any OBGYN emergency. Um, help managing labor and delivering patients, uh, providing evaluation and disposition for uh, private physicians patients that may need a, a quick consult or a sidewalk consult or evaluation of fetal heart rate tracing, etc. We can also provide inpatient cons consults and supervise uh, nursing and CNM res residents and CNMs as well, oversight of, of certified nurse midwives. And, um, and then uh, facilitating discharges is very important to the hospital, as we all know. 
And so, and then one that's uh, not listed there is uh, transport services, and that is increasing the 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 uh, volume of maternal transports or the ability to provide um, maternal transport acceptance. So, on the next slide, uh, we, we're going to talk about the unexpected uh, deliverables, the benefits, and beneficiaries of an OB hospitalist program. There's a lot of benefits that you might expect. Back in 2007 and uh, 2008, when we first started our programs, we anticipated that there were going to be that we would see certain benefits as these programs evolved. And in fact, some of those have proven to be true. Uh, the benefits for hospitals and patients uh, improve safety and outcomes. That is very well documented now. That in fact, uh, OB/GYN hospitals programs do that. There's uh, articles that we have referenced in this presentation that I would encourage you to read. That uh, in fact affirm that in these programs improve patient safety and outcomes. Improved satisfaction, and that's improved satisfaction among just uh, across many different uh, people. That's nursing, administration, the physicians on the medical staff, uh, and then reduced stress. We anticipated that would uh, be the case, and in fact it is, uh, especially for nurses knowing that uh, OB emergencies can be addressed immediately without having to wait for contacting the private physician and the, the physician to come from home, et cetera. And then the benefits for physicians is just that satisfaction in, in, in improving patient outcomes and knowing that that 24-7 availability of an inpatient board-certified OB-GYN uh, is, is, is going to improve the, uh, the outcomes overall. And then reduce burnout, which actually applies to the OB hospitalist as well as the physicians that are practicing at the facility. Uh, the, the OB hospitalists, many of them left private practice to become hospitalists because they were becoming burnout and it extends their careers by functioning as a hospitalist instead of a private practitioner. And then we hear that many private practitioners feel it's going to reduce their burnout and maybe even prolong their careers. The next slide talks about what we may not have expected or what, you, what we may not have expected from the programs back when we started them back in 2007. And these are some of the benefits that we've seen uh, for hospitals and patients. Reduced C-section rates is very well documented now. And we thought that would happen back in 2007, 2008 when we started the programs. That's now been confirmed. Um, increased consistency in high-risk protocols is a huge benefit that things are done consistently per evidence-based protocols on a regular and continuous basis. And all of this facilitates better teamwork as well. Uh, and of course, communication is the is the key to better teamwork, and uh, we see that in all of our facilities that um, that, that is, a, is an added um, benefit to it. As far as benefits for physicians, uh, it's nice having board-certified OBGYNs in the, in the facility 24-7 uh, and having that knowledge and those skills present in L&D all the time uh, makes everyone rest more comfortably, especially during night hours when there's not so many physicians present to handle emergencies, et cetera. And then the decrease in malpractice cost. Again, another thing that we expected or anticipated would probably happen, uh, but we did probably didn't expect to see it this quickly. And what we're seeing is decreased malpractice uh, cost to hospitals, uh, to physicians, um, and um, uh, not just to the physicians working in the facility, but also even physicians that practice at facilities um, that now have OB-GYN hospitalist programs. So the next slide is just kind of a summary of some of the benefits that we've witnessed. Uh, it doesn't include them all, but um, it, uh, it definitely improves patient safety as discussed earlier. Um, the hospitals that have programs have, have shown improved ability to recruit and retain new OB-GYN physicians to their medical staff. They improve quality of life for physicians. That includes both, as I mentioned earlier, the hospitalist and the OB-GYN physicians. Uh, better throughput for L&D triage or your OBED, whichever you have. Um, the acceptance of high-risk transfer patients to support NICU services is an added plus. Uh, and then the decreased cost of rehiring and retraining nurses to improve satisfaction and retention. What we're seeing and what our hospitals are seeing now is well, new higher labor and delivery nurses preferring hospitals that have OBGYN hospitals programs over those that don't. And the cost of rehiring and retraining nurses on a study that we did approximately five years ago at that time was a cost of the hospital of about 30,000 per nurse. So it's a, it's a significant number. 
And then what we've also witnessed is uh, high levels of patient, nurse, physician, and administration satisfaction with the programs. So more of the unexpected benefits are those impacting the bottom line. And um, so the next slide kind of illustrates that, um, that the importance of that and it's important to facilities to make sure the program is financially sound and makes financial sense. And so when, the, when, when our programs facilitate the maintenance and growth of NICU admissions, it grows the market share. Um, when um, we do reduce risk and liability premiums and you, you create a cost-effective program for the hospital, uh, then it has a major impact on the bottom line. The other thing that it does, as, as illustrated on the next slide, is you can expect less stress. Um, I would not say that this was one of the primary expectations 10 to 13 years ago as these programs are being created, but with physicians available 24-7 to respond quickly to emergencies um, and the reduction in potential medical legal liability for the hospital, the nursing staff, and the OB-GYN medical staff, then you see a reduce in stress on OB physicians, the, the OB hospitalists, the medical staff, the nurses, the ED, and the hospital administration. So the next question is our second poll question, and um, if the audience could respond, just the ones that um, do not have an OB hospitals program, which um, proved to be the majority of you, do you feel that your organization has adequate support for call coverage from the community OBGYNs or the call schedule? I would like to come back to this question at the end of the uh, presentation, but time's not going to allow that. Uh, but uh, it would be interesting to come back and re-ask this question ever. So if you would take the time to ask that que answer that question, uh, and that would just be for the ones that um, that feel that, um, that that have a physician call schedule that they work from. 30% yes, 33% somewhat, so 60, oh, this changes still. Okay, so there are the results, and uh, somewhat or no would be some 53%. Thank you for that. Another topic I wanted to discuss is, uh, is outpatient services, and it, it seems like a, uh, an unreasonable question. It certainly seemed like an unreasonable question 10 to 13 years ago when we started this, but what about your LB hospitals program actually providing some outpatient services? Um, this is something we didn't really think would happen. Uh, this was the idea of physicians moving from private practice to OB hospitalists. It was a older, more seasoned physicians. And um, so we didn't anticipate that those people would be interested in providing or that the OB hospitals pr program would be providing uh, hospital services. So on the next slide, we have um, uh, six safety stats and um, that a safety-focused hospital shouldn't be without a OB hospitals program. And these statistics everyone should know. And we have the references here. It's kind of a busy slide, uh, but I would uh, it's got some pretty significant data to it. And the references are below that you can uh, pull those articles up if you want to want to touch on them. But statistics that every hospital needs to know is that 77% of obstetricians have had at least one liability claim. Uh, in reviewing, 40% of those claims uh, actually could have been prevented, and 40% of MPIC and QAS hospitals utilize OB hospitalist. Um, the, the research has shown that an OB hospitalist program has a reduction in likelihood of C-sections by 15%. And then a study out of Yale showed that you can see up to a 95% uh, reduction in direct liability premiums. Uh, and that paper actually was um, evolved around the, the hospital establishing a comprehensive obstetric safety program, uh, which consisted of measures to standardize care, improve teamwork and communication, and optimize oversight, optimize oversight and quality review. It's a very interesting article. I would encourage you to look at it because that's a very significant reduction in, mal, in uh, direct liability payments. And then uh, all the programs have shown increased volume of deliveries uh, with OB hospitalist. 
So we feel like the the OB hospitalists have a bright future, um, and so I want to I want to talk about how OB hospitalist programs are evolving and a few predictions that we have for the future. So the, the primary question is: Is this becoming the standard of care? Um, in in our opinion, it is. Uh, I think if you read the uh, original article back in 2003, um, that there was an inclination of that. There was a very good article in 2013 by Dr. Shrinivius that addressed that and said that, in fact, the trend uh, based on the data that they collected showing uh, the, statistics, uh, the statistics that I've already discussed, the uh, decreased C-section rate, the improved outcomes, improved patient safety, et cetera, so they're continuing research on that as to why is that with OB hospitalist programs. So we do believe that the standard of care for the future will be OB hospitalist programs. We also think and, and are making another prediction, um, um, as indicated on the next slide, that obstetrics and gynecology care is going to evolve into three OB-GYN specialties. Uh, again, this is a prediction. Uh, many of our predictions have come true since 2007, 2008 when we started. But what we're seeing as we travel across the country is uh, our specialty evolving into these three subspecialties, if you will. And that is the OB hospitalist, which we're discussing today, the inpatient OB care. We're also seeing a large trend toward outpatient OB gens with no hospital privileges. They still provide prenatal care because that's a pipeline of new patients into their practice. Um, and they still do GYN, and if the patient needs surgery, they send the patient to their colleague down the street that does gynecological surgery and then refers the patient back to them. And for their prenatal care, they work closely with the OB hospitalist team uh, to deliver and take care of their patients on the inpatient side and delivery, et cetera, with the, with the expectation that that patient will be referred back to their practice for continuation of gynecological care. So it's an interesting trend, and we're seeing it more and more, and uh, it's something we're keeping our eye on. The next slide talks about some trends uh, that we believe will continue. Um, we believe these trends will continue to illustrate to be true for OB hospitalist programs. Uh, there's plenty of research going on nowadays to, to look into this and try to determine why these outcomes and these trends are present with OB hospitalist programs. But we can we anticipate the decrease. We'll continue to see a decrease in C-section rates, uh, fewer unattended deliveries, uh, increase in VBAC attempts and success rates. We're seeing in all of our programs now. Uh, we think the trend of decreased malpractice claims will continue. Um, a decrease in malpractice premiums to the hospitalists hospitals with OB hospitalist programs. Uh, we've we've done several proposals lately that in fact the uh, the malpractice carriers give the hospitals and the OBGYNs that practice there a significant decrease in their malpractice premium and decreased length to stay as um, medically appropriate. Um, but growth isn't always easy, and the obstacles to implementing an OB hospitalist program um, can be rather significant. Uh, it's a it's an arduous process of of um, of uh, hiring the right people and, and making the program work. It's a, it's a very intensive process to make a, the program work for the hospital the way the hospital expects it to. And there are several things that can go wrong. Um, you can have inexperienced physicians. Uh, the level of training, level of experience may not be what you need to make a hospital's program work. Uh, you can have system issues. And, and the bottom is, could a bad program make things worse? And absolutely. Uh, if it's a true quality, patient safety focused program, uh, that focuses on improving clinical outcomes, and that's the three primary goals of the program, it's hard to go wrong. But in a lot of programs we've seen where it hasn't gone right, it's a situation where it's not a true OB hospitalist program or laborers program, but it's more of that deck doc coverage or on-call coverage, um, and it's usually comprised of physicians that actually still have a private practice that are working hard to make their private practice work and and then using uh, and then uh, functioning as an OB hospitalist at night or on weekends or something. Um, so the next slide um, talks about what is the best type of physician to be, or what is the best type of physician qualified to be a hospitalist. And I would say this has changed over the years as well. When we first started, we were, we were using seasoned physicians, older physicians that had had several years of practice. 
that were looking for a change, looking to get out of private practice. Uh, there's not a lot of seasoned physicians left anymore. And so the average age of our hospitals has dropped some 10 years since we started 10 years ago. New graduates out of residency are probably truly not the best candidates to be hospitalists. Uh, they're still working on their board certification, their, their case pre their gathering their case presentations for their oral boards, and uh, probably just don't have enough experience. We, however, are focusing on programs to, to hire new graduates out of residency to become hospitalists with a rigorous training, skills, uh, skills labs, uh, things like that to bring them uh, up to speed and, and to prepare them to become OB hospitalists uh, almost right out of residency. Uh, initially, we hired board certified uh, physicians only. Uh, but board eligible physicians are are being hired now uh, with the expectation that their their board certification will come uh, within just a year or two of being hired as a as an OBGYN hospitalist. So a program should have a strategic plan that involves uh, something along these lines. The next slide represents uh, the six pillars uh, that we go with to uh, and it's part of our plan to achieve success for the program. And it's a strategic plan like many, many organizations have, and this is just an example of the way we do it. It focuses on people, organization, quality patient services, and growth uh, marketing and uh, financial. So the first slide is, is great people. And when I was reviewing this, this presentation, I was like, I think it's almost like Donald Trump wrote this part of the presentation. I promise that's not the case, even though it's going to sound like it. Uh, but you do need uh, growth. You have, you've got to have great people in the organization to make the OB hospitals program work. And primarily, that there has to be that commitment from everyone within the organization uh, to provide in that quality of care that we, we keep referring to. And flex, in hiring physicians, flexibility, in my opinion, is the most important characteristic when we're looking for physicians to be great physicians in our, in our organization is they've got to be flexible. And sometimes the seasoned physicians uh, have a little trouble with that. And it's something that you're going to be working with uh, many different types of patients. You're going to be working with many different people and many different OBGYN physicians in these programs that practice in different ways. And you've got to be flexible and, and be willing to uh, do things maybe differently than you did in, when you were in private practice and realize that that's okay. Uh, residency trained, of course, board certified or and or board eligible. We prefer high risk OBGYN experience. Private practice experience is, is preferred, but not always is not always um, possible. Uh, it, it adds to the physician's ability to be flexible, and also to um, to communicate uh, with nursing staff, administration, et cetera, to have that experience under your belt. Most uh, programs will not uh, not allow their OBGYNs to practice in a competitive service area. Um, that can that's not a that's not an absolute. Uh, it's preferred, um, and sometimes the uh, people practicing in competitive service area may function as part-time fill-ins, etc. Uh, the most OB pro programs have extended CME requirements and education requirements. Of course, they need to be professional and compassionate, responsive to all patients with excellent skills and it's really it's really important to be dedicated to teaching, supervising, and promoting education because a lot of what we do is in fact that. Um, you need the right people and the right physicians. Um, we like to have an OB hospitals team dedicated to delivering exceptional care. They've got to be aligned with hospital goals for quality patient safety and these improved outcomes and um, the, the physicians really need to be engaged. Uh, they, they need to be engaged with what the goals of the program are because every hospital's goals when contracting with an OBGYN hospital program and outsourcing those services is different. And, and, and the, the vendor has to be really cognizant of what those goals are. And they're, they're constantly changing. And the hospitalist program has to be willing to change as the hospital's goals change. And therefore, the people that are working for the OB hospitals program also have to be committed uh, to making those changes as well. And then the physicians need to be committed to fostering those long-term relationships with the medical staff, the OB-GYN physicians, uh, everyone involved, maternal fetal medicine, neonatologist, administration, et cetera. So what does it take to run uh, a successful OB hospitals program? 
again, and I can't emphasize this enough, have to be committed uh, to being organized enough to know who you are and, and to prove you are what you say you are. Uh, and that can only be done with data. Uh, and, and so it's very important that you have the organization to collect the data. There's standard data that needs to be collected, but there's also data that needs to, uh, to, to portray what the hospital's program truly is and what it's doing for the facility. So you have to have defined performance goals. Uh, you need dashboards. Uh, those need to be quality dashboards or quality measures as mentioned right below that. But you also need volume dashboards. And your dashboards need to be flexible. They need to represent what the hospital uh, needs to wants to accomplish. It needs to be flexible. It needs to be able to adjust to what any factors the hospital may uh, identify as weaknesses that are, are things that they want to focus on. And so you've got, you've got to have the ability to gather the data and show the hospital what they're wanting to see and then showing the hospital who you really are and that you, you are who you say you are. You need management reports that address the billing revenue and the subsidy. Uh, these reports need to uh, indicate the payer mix, the, the, the patient volumes, uh, an age analysis, and, and of course, what are you doing? So you've got to identify what your top diagnosis codes are for each facility. And then you have to have independent practice audits. You, you, most of these programs, as you know, are expensive. They're, most of them are heavily subsidized by the facility. And so we have to have independent practice audits and we have to maximize our ability to charge, capture, bill, and collect the money to offset the cost of the program as much as possible and decrease the amount of subsidy uh, that's being required. So the next, the next slide summarizes our plan and, it, and, and that is designing a strategic plan that's focused on these three factors that I mentioned over and over again. Uh, and that is improving the quality of care improving the patient safety at the facility, and improving the clinical outcomes. And to do that, you need the right plan. And that plan is a philosophy and approach centered around single team facility coverage. Same physicians, same facility all the time. Um, oftentimes that's not possible, but ideally you want to hire the same, you, you want to hire a team that is specifically designated to provide OB hospital services at that facility so that those relationships referred to earlier can develop and those communication issues become easy. And uh, that can only be accomplished with a program that's, that provides you the same physicians on a rotating basis. Uh, like I said, it's not always possible, but when it is possible, that's the way we like to approach it. Um, you've got to have a plan that provides cost-effective OB hospitals care. I've already addressed that. It's expensive. It requires a subsidy. So it needs to be a cost-effective program and you need a seamless and efficient implementation plan. So the next slide demonstrates uh, the models of OB hospitals programs. The most common, of course, is a 24-7 uh, coverage model. It's a 12-hour shift model, 7A to 7P, 7P to 7A. That's just how ours is structured. There's many ways to structure it. Uh, we do allow back-to-back 12-hour -back shifts, uh, let's say 24-hour shift, if you will, in, at certain locations that are lower volume and lower acuity. Uh, a 24-7 model requires four to five FTEs. Um, it requires the hospitals working uh, 7A to 7P to provide the, and do the daily rounds and discharges. Then there's also hybrid models. I won't spend a lot of time on it, but a hybrid model for OB hospitals program is made up of full-time OB hospitals that are employed by the outsourcing agent, and then some part-time help that is, uh, could be staff or faculty ob -Gen physicians at the facility. And it could be Monday, it could be a program that only provides coverage Monday through Friday, 7 a to 7 p in-house or Monday through Friday call coverage. It could be a nocturnist program. It could be a weekend on-call coverage. It doesn't really define itself as an OB hospitals program or a labor's program, but oftentimes it's a model that can be implemented at a facility that may not have the volume of patients that it needs or financially just can't afford a full 24-7 model in anticipation and hopes of growing their program to the point where it can become a 24-7 model. We've successfully done that with a couple of programs now and it's definitely something that a smaller hospital, smaller volume hospital may want to consider. Each program has a designated full-time um, medical director. 
That person is one of the OB hospitalists at the facility, so they're working clinically as well as administratively, oversee the program, responsible for scheduling it, and they have protected administrative time, and they have regular meetings with the administration of the hospital to discuss the program. And then also a regional medical director that provides oversight for four to five of the programs. Um, the next thing it requires as the, as the next slide is great quality. I, I told you it sounded like Donald Trump. It's great people, it's great quality, it's, but it is true. All these slides are true. Um, and it, the quality is, has to be demonstrated. It has to be data, it has to be demonstrated and going to be demonstrated through data collection as I mentioned before. So there has to be a routine and regular assessment of medical risk and management issues. The program needs to have evidence-based policies and procedures and protocols in place so that if I have an OB hospitalist program uh, on the north side of town and the south side of town and the east part of the country or the west part of the country, all that care is being delivered in the same evidence-based way. So if I have a hospitalist that works in California that needs to work a shift for a vacationing hospitalist in New York, uh, and it's, it's within our program system that the, the, the way that care is delivered is going to be the same across the board. Um, it has to be committed to performance metrics like core measure, skip, PQRS, and coming soon, ACRA and MIPS. Uh, and you need a Quest DR is specific to our company. Uh, similar, there's, there's many similar models out there, but you need a mo you need one of these systems that focuses on maximizing your charge capturing, your billing, and that system for us also functions as our data collection and communication system. And you've got to have one of these systems in place to maximize uh, the, the quality of the program. So how to improve and continue to promote quality? I can't emphasize enough the standardization of the approach to care. You have to have those consistent policies, procedures, and protocols. Um, you provide tools to improve patient care and communication um, is a must. I, again, ours is Quest DR, but there's plenty of those systems out there. But that's our communication tool for staying in touch with all the providers and all the physicians of the patients that we care for. Uh, simulation and skills training for hospitals. That could be ACLS certification, uh, advanced fetal heart rate monitoring, postpartum hemorrhage skills, uh, um, you, you know, all the, all the, uh, the, the skills that uh, are required for nurses and physicians. Uh, based on their peri perinatal care initiative, et cetera. Um, offer resident curriculum and rotation with the OB hospitalist program. It's great for residents. It, it educates the residents. Uh, we work with many residency programs in our, in, uh, through Quest Care, uh, MCARE. And, uh, and, not, and not only is it good for the residents and good for the hospital, it's also good for the hospitalists to, to stay on their toes and, and realize they're responsible for educating residents on, on current practice and uh, current policies. So, um, and then the hospitalist teams at all of our facilities facilitate simulations 24/7 for physicians and nurses. So it's it's like if you're if you're having to do postpartum hemorrhage drills, uh, the night person can actually do that with the nurses that are on the night shift at two in the morning when there's some downtime, and so it makes that available 24/7. Then also, uh, it's more and more of our programs are providing certified nurse midwife support. The next slide is just an example of one of our programs on the performance uh, data and dashboards. It's most no, most everybody's familiar with that. Uh, but the, again, this is something that is designed for each facility. There's there's set data points that you want to want to approach PQRS, uh, uh, skip you know skip measurements, um, uh, core measures, uh, uh, et cetera. And uh, but then you also want to have a system in place that can specifically uh, track specific quality measures that the hospital may be interested in. Uh, the next slide just talks about great services. Um, uh, the OB Hospitals program has to provide improved patient services uh, and, and they do that by providing improved quality of care, 24-7 availability uh, in labor and delivery, uh, the convenience of having the physicians, the improved safety that comes with that coverage, uh, all programs should have the uh, potential for better outcomes. Even in programs that we've started where the hospitals have excellent outcomes, we've still improved uh, the overall uh, quality of care and improved outcomes. 
Um, communication is the key to making that work, and again, the uh, continuous education and training. So from a marketing standpoint, the program in itself, mar a good quality program will market the, the, the hospitals, OBGYN hospitals program. If, I'm sorry, sorry about that. Um, so if you have a OB hospitals program that is in fact focused on and improving patient safety, is focused on delivering and improving the quality of care, and is focused on um, there we go. That's a slide I need. I'm sorry. And is focused on excellent clinical outcomes. That in itself is going to be a marketing tool, and and with that marketing tool, the facility is going to see growth in uh, in in the women's services. The public is becoming very much aware of OB hospitals programs. Up until about two to three years ago, um, the, the the term OB hospitals program or labors program was um, was almost an unknown, e even to a lot of OBGYNs. Uh, what we're seeing now is that uh, even the public is becoming aware of hospitals that have OB hospitals programs, and so uh, offering a quality program is a great marketing tool within itself. And that program can also be marketed through the OBGYN staff physicians uh, that work at that facility, uh, explaining to the patient population that, you know, we have this program at our hospital now, availability of board-certified physicians in-house 24-7. And that's reassuring to the patients, and, and I think that's part of the reason that uh, the patients are becoming more aware of this. So how do you market it? Well, there's some key messages uh, to deliver to patients and to physicians. Um, the key message to the patients are listed there, board certified physicians in-house 24-7, help facilitate your care, whether it's a walk-in, drop-in patient, uh, or a patient that's visiting from out of town that has services, or needs services, and, or the OBGYN medical staff physicians that uh, need an OBED visit at 2 a.m. in the morning. Uh, always present to handle emergency situations and provide quick evaluations in the OBED. Uh, the, the patients aren't spending an extended period of time in the OBD waiting for the physician that's in the office to, to get away from the office to see them. All programs are going to sign care for unassigned patients, and the programs, in fact, do have proven quality. The key message to physicians is that it, it takes away the call burden. Uh, that was one of the primary reasons the program started uh, 10 to 13 years ago, was that the program could, in fact, alleviate the call burden of uh, physicians and hopefully reduce burnout and uh, you know, create a create an environment that added longevity to the practice of obstetrics. Um, the uh, programs improve productivity and um, allows physicians to expand their practice. Uh, they can spend more time in the office um, with the aid of the LBGen Hospitals program. It helps prevent prevent burnout. Again, that's in the case of the hospitalist and the physicians. Uh, the programs are, are great for patient care, and um, and to the physicians, you can say, you know, upon request or in a clinical emergency circumstance, the uh, OBGYN hospitalist is always available. And um, the the program should offer some type of coverage for the uh, independent practitioners in the hospital, and and that coverage could be for a few hours or a few days, and that's called, what we refer to as extended services for the physicians on the medical staff, and those services include consultations, disposition of patients, complete management, uh, rounding and discharging the patients, and uh, cesarean assist. So number six is a great financial plan. Uh, the, as I mentioned earlier, the programs are somewhat expensive, and they do require subsidy. So the program has to have a, a very well-defined financial plan that emphasizes what cost-saving measures are, are being put in place. Um, it has to to realize what patients are being dealt with, what, what is the population of patients. So you have to have volume indicators. Um, you know, what are we, what type of patients are we seeing? Uh, what procedures are we doing the most of, et cetera? Um, you have to have processes in place for training uh, and, and efficiencies that reduce the subsidy. Um, it has to be a, a, an approach that is a cost-effective revenue offset financial model. 
um, because again, the, the subs is significant. Uh, you have to have a focus on growing the services and revenue, and that can only be done by a, a uh, focused OB program that is constantly in touch with administration, with nursing, uh, et cetera, and, and identifying how the hospital, where the hospital wants to be one, three, five years from now, and how are we going to grow the services, and what can the OB hospitalist team do to help facilitate the growth of those services, thus enhancing the revenue. Uh, you've got to have the strong billing capabilities, as I mentioned earlier, and then there has to be strategic contracting with payers. Uh, sometimes it's better to be out of network, and sometimes it's better to be in network. That can only be uh, recognized and, and addressed with the uh, appropriate uh, collection of data and knowing again who your who your customer base is, and um, and it's got to be focused on a possible reduction in the malpractice premiums for the facility and for the physicians that practice there as well. So the next slide is um, just an idea of the volume indicators. Uh, it's not all inclusive. It's specific for one of our facilities again. And I can't emphasize enough that your volume indicators are what help you identify your customer base, who you're dealing with on a regular basis, and that drives the program, it drives the financials, it drives the potential uh, new development of services, perinatal service lines that need to be developed. And so you have to have the uh, right volume indicators and you have to track those appropriately. So now do you want to in-house your program or outsource your program? And um, that has to be decided what is the best choice uh, for your facility. So the next poll question is, um, is your organization planning to develop or contract for an OBGYN hospitalist program in the next 12 months? And if you'll just take a minute to select one of those answers, then we'll talk about whether to outsource or in keep that in-house. Okay, so almost 40% are considering that. So, the next slide just is really what I would encourage you to focus on if you're going to outsource your program or keep it in-house. Um, can you guarantee these factors with, with an in-house program because, the, again, these are all the factors that we've discussed. Again, I'm, I'm not going to go through these one by one, but um, these are all the things that we've mentioned, and I think these are the things that you should uh, keep this list available when you're looking at whether you're going to keep your services in-house or out-house, and these, uh, outsource these. And these are the questions you need to be asking. Uh, the next slide demonstrates some more uh, of those um, things that you need to focus on. Again, all these have been addressed prior to now, um, and so I won't list, I won't go those one by one. Uh, so my question would be, what are the advantages of outsourcing? Because there is growing evidence in the literature supporting outsourcing, especially for the reduction in the hospital malpractice and liability premiums. So I would just encourage you to look for programs with a reputation for the following. Uh, and those are represented on the next slide. Um, you want to find a program that has a history, a, a positive history of increasing volumes of revenue year after year, uh, outpatient facilities, if that's something you're considering, or if you think that might be something that the, uh, the hospital's program would help you with, uh, uh, programs that are focused on improving or increasing, I should say, maternal transports and NICU admissions, and just an overall focus on expanding peri perinatal service lines for your hospital. Uh, you also want to look for programs that have a plan for um, addressing and definitively answering all past and present questions regarding physicians and programs. Um, the next slide um, shows that you know you need a program that's cognizant and committed to the focus of quality, patient safety, and, and clinical outcomes. I'm sorry, that next slide's not coming up. There it is. Let's go to the previous slide, please. Thank you. Uh, your program um, 
has, needs to have a clearly defined plan for developing the awareness and a focus in the new practice uh, and the established standards for both, for both the OB hospitalist and, and the OB program. Okay, now we can do that next slide. And look for a company that shows results. This is just one of our divisions, um, and uh, some of these are volume data uh, that we collected, 185 unattended deliveries avoided, 35 obstetrical saves uh, in one program, just one program, and nearly 400 maternal transports. Uh, we've expanded our outpatient clinical services on request of the facility, and 100% compliance with quality initiatives, and knock on wood, no malpractice claims. Obstetrical save is a vague term. It's a term we use for an emergency delivery performed, uh, either an operative vaginal delivery or cesarean delivery that's performed in an emergent situation where no other OBGYN is on campus to provide that same service. So it's a really, real specifically defi defined um, definition. It may not be consistent among, pro uh, consistent among other vendors, but within our organization, that's how we define obstetrical save. So the next slide just kind of summarizes what outsourcing adds. And this is something that I would just encourage you if you're considering keeping it in-house or outsourcing, uh, that I would just make the next three slides kind of a dartboard, if you will. And when you're sitting around with your committee talking about how you're going to develop your OBGYN hospitals program, then just take a dart and throw it. And wherever it lands, just have that discussion. Because your OB hospitals program should provide all three of those uh, all the components on all three of those slides. The next slide just kind of uh, represents our data collection, uh, charge capturing, retrieval system and, and that, that we use to maximize our data collection. Again, there's a lot of these systems available out there. We use QuestDR, uh, which is powered through Medimobile out of Austin, Texas. Uh, it just enhances our ability to capture charges real time as we're rounding on patients. Uh, we're submitting charges directly to the billing company. Uh, it has shown to increase revenue within our programs by some uh, 14 to 18 percent. Uh, and this is something, if you're out there in your private practice, you can also utilize something like this for your private practice, too, to maximize your charge capturing. And again, we use it as a, a communication tool with all, all physicians. So we achieve this by, as the next slide indicates, uh, creating the culture. Um, we think we do a good job of that. Um, you have to have the appropriate behavior and attitudes and approaches to care. It requires education. You've got to hire the right physicians. We try to really identify those physicians with leadership qualities and, and leadership potential. And again, I mentioned this over and over again, but a consistent, a consistent and standardized approach to everything. Uh, we also have thorough recruiting, interviewing, hiring, and onboarding processes. Uh, we want to identify the strengths and weaknesses of all physicians so we can uh, channel them into leadership programs that focus on making them better leaders, medical directors, regional medical directors, etc. And then also utilizing those physician streaks to benefit others within the organization and alleviate weaknesses. There's got to be continuous training and education for all on an ongoing basis. And um, we've, we've, we have uh, specific requirements, which I won't go into now, uh, that do that. We achieve this through, the, again, the three things I mentioned over and over, patient safety, improved quality, and focused on uh, improved clinical outcomes. Uh, we do this by improving physicians' clinical performance. Uh, we try to optimize our care through collaboration. That's directly face-to-face -face conversations as well as through our uh, Quest DR that I, that I alluded to earlier. Uh, we have an educational peer review process uh, and strategies to minimize risk. And of course, the financial awareness of healthcare overall and OB hospitals programs specifically. So our strategic plan for sustainable success is focused on education processes, leadership training, what are the best clinical practice, standardizing care, and then something we developed internally, which is SSAT, simulation skills and thrills, which is a hands-on training education process required for all physicians to go through. Um, and it's an extensive collaborative effort uh, and is, uh, will begin in November of 2017. This is also will be required for all new hires um, and then ongoing every two years thereafter. But the real key, just like it is to everything, as the next slide illustrates, is communication. Um, 
to, you've got to assess the program's strengths and weaknesses and assure future success. Uh, and to do that, the OB Hospitals program must place a priority on communication. And that requires regular meetings with administration, hospital-driven outreach initiatives. Um, you have to have a dialogue for expanding the perinatal service line specific to the facility. There's got to be continuous relationship building with maternal fetal medicines, OBs, nursing staff, administration. Uh, and there has to be staff involvement. And uh, there, ha there has to have con you have to have continuous process improvement uh, discussions. So I think that concludes my presentation. I uh, hope I didn't bore you too much. Um, and at this time, I would open up for any questions with a little bit of time we have remaining. And I would encourage you uh, that if you have any questions after, this, uh, after the webinar, feel free to contact me through MCARE, uh, QuestCare, um, or you can directly email me with any questions you may have. And I uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Farley, for that fantastic presentation. We will now begin today's question and answer session. Please submit any questions you have by typing them into your control panel in the space labeled Enter a Question for Staff and clicking Send. We will try to get through as many questions as we have time for. Our first question is, can you give a specific change in malpractice cost reduction? Um, I can, actually. The, the, the Yale um, article referred to earlier in the slide is the one I would encourage you to read. Um, and it's, a, it's quite impressive, the, the values that they talk about in there uh, as far as how much. Um, but the way that study was performed was it was two, fi two five-year periods were studied before the program was implemented and afterwards. So a total of 10 years were actually reviewed. And um, the claims dropped some... Uh, 50% or so, and the payments on claims uh, went from $50.7 million to $2.9 million after the implementation of their, their comprehensive obstetric safety program. So it's, 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 it's indicative of what, and I don't want to say that you're going to see those kind of results with every OB hospitals program, but it is indicative of the, of the changes that you can see in the decrease in malpractice if you do have a comprehensive obstetric safety program, which the OB Hospitals program would only be a component of that. But the, the, and, and there are other articles out there uh, that reference similar results as well. Fantastic. Um, okay, so it actually looks like we only have time for one more question, um, which is, is the trend to also use an OBED model? Yes, the the um, and there's several reasons for the OBED model. Um, and for those of you who aren't familiar that don't have an OBED, it's it actually converts your triage unit that you now that you now see patients in when they present to an actual e an extension of the ER. So it becomes an OBED as, as you know. There's rules and guidelines for which patients when they present to the ER go to labor and delivery or stay in the emergency room for evaluation. So it expands the, the, the number of patients that you can actually have come to labor and delivery. Many facilities now are actually building a separate ED, OBED, uh, within their labor and delivery unit. Most facilities uh, utilize bed space that they have already in the triage area and convert that to what's called an OBED. There are specific requirements required to convert your triage to an OBED. Uh, some of those are federal and some are state-specific, uh, but it does require a certain amount of space, uh, ability to monitor uh, pulse oximetry, uh, EKG. Uh, um, it requires, of course, the ability to resuscitate patients. Uh, and what that does is uh, it allows an ob to be seen almost every OB patient that presents to the hospital for evaluation. Uh, and it increases revenue significantly for the institutions from a facility standpoint. Physician services, it doesn't have much effect. Uh, but the overall quality of care is improved to your to your OB population because every patient is being seen by a board certified ob -GYN. So the patient that presents for abdominal pain that in fact could be contractions, but in fact may not be contractions, is then evaluated by the ob -GYN through the OBED visit. And so the trend nationwide is for most triage units to convert over to an OBED. Well, that's really interesting. Thank you so much, Dr. Fali. 
Um, that is actually all the time we have for today. Thank you all for your great questions. And I also want to thank Dr. Fali for his excellent presentation and to our audience for participating today. Enjoy the rest of your day, and we look forward to having you join us for future webinars.